make sure that your games aren't too skill-based. I made that mistake myself. A too skill-based game, you don't get people to pay, for, pay you because there's no reason to. That is the biggest red flag uh, for anybody who enjoys video games in general. Today, we're going to talk about how Rise of Kingdoms tricked and deceived each and every one of us who has spent money in this game. Now, raise your hand if you think that the developers of Rise of Kingdoms built this game around war. Listen, I thought that too, but this game is actually built around resource management and behavioral psychology because that's where the money is, ladies and gentlemen. The other day, I came across this video called Let's Go Whaling Tricks for Monetizing Mobile Game Players with Free to Play. And uh, that like to dislike ratio just goes to show how upset players are when they realize that games these days are built with monetization strategies first and gameplay second. As I was watching this video, I couldn't help but think, oh my god, every single thing that this dude is talking about is exactly what Rise of Kingdoms does. So let's go ahead and watch the video and I'll give you my thoughts. I'm here to talk about monetization. So the, the tricks on, on how to monetize a game well, some of you will probably... Uh, be slightly shocked by all the tricks I have listed here, but I'll leave the morality of it out of the talk. We can discuss it uh, if we have time later. So right off the bat, this is a presentation that this gentleman is giving to a room full of people who are either mobile game developers or people who are interested in making a mobile game. And one of the first things that he says before the presentation even begins is that the morality of this behavior is questionable. And I absolutely agree. It is exploiting player psychology to get them to spend money more. First off, Wall Street Trader and Oil Shea got into a fight. Who won? You guys did. You can hear the crowd laughing in the background because they know that this is true. I mean, think about it. In Rides of Kingdoms, if you have two mega whales fighting, literally Lilith is winning because those players are going to be buying fate changers. They're going to be spending money to train troops. And the richer these players are, the more money Lilith makes. A lot of the spend comes from, from the high high paying guys, the whales, and the very best way to get these guys to spend is to get two rich competitive guys to fight each other and tell them I'll give you a slight upside if you pay me. So this is true. This is true, right? Uh, we see this in KVK, but I would say probably 95% of you who are watching this video have spent less than $20 on Rise of Kingdoms. The best way to make sure of both your retention and your monetization is to make sure you have enough of an in-game economy in there. Top grossing games have in-game economies worth tens of thousands. That's how you can uh, keep people in there. They have lots of things to do, to, to stuff to upgrade, to progress along, and that's how you can, can make them, them spend a lot as well, since you can, for instance, uh, give a huge uh, discount on something, you know, uh, this stuff is worth 150 uh, euros, but now I'll give it to you for five. Oh, that's weird. I've uh, I've never heard of that strategy before at all. Yeah, Rise of Kingdoms does this all the time. They will have a pop-up bundle that shows up and it'll say, this is how much this bundle is worth, but for you, we're going to give it to you for five bucks. And they make it feel like it's a big deal or whatever. I also would like to point out that he chose to use a literal demon or the devil grabbing a stack of cash. Like, bro, you, you really, you're not hiding anything, are you? Like, you're really Really going to be as deceptive as you possibly can be and again we are starting the very first slide says make sure it's possible that when you build your game that players can spend at least a thousand dollars if not ten grand or more that's why people say games in the past are better than games now like Super Mario 64 or Halo 2 for example no monetization strategy just gameplay because gameplay comes first but clearly not anymore I've seen suggestions to model what you sell according to Bartle types I assume you're all familiar with Bartle types. So really quick, Bartle types actually came from a study done in 1996, classifying four different types of video game players. There are killers, achievers, socializers, and explorers. This is why you guys who play Rise of Kingdoms play it for different reasons. Some of you play it to kill other players. Some of you play it to collect all the commanders. Some of you play it to meet new people. What he's saying here is that you should match the way that you can entice players to spend with the types of players that might be playing. You sell convenience to the achievers, which really means faster progress, customization to socializers, uh, hats and stuff, uh, competitive advantage, that is pay to win for the killers, and content for explorers. 
Now, the reason I highlighted convenience over, up there or, or progress is that most of your sales will be here. Uh, customization, hats and stuff, they're nice, but you, you'll have a single digit percentage of your income coming from that. So this is pretty straightforward, right? I'm sure you guys have seen when you hit a certain city hall level, there's a bundle that pops up that says, progress even faster to the next level. Customization, right? We have avatar frames, we have different city skins that you can get from holiday events. Competitive advantage, this is obvious. We're talking about the War Machine bundle. We're talking about the bundles that show up during the season of Conquest KVKs. And content, this one isn't as heavily uh, utilized by Rise of Kingdoms, but I, I think you guys get the idea competitive advantage is good but you can go overboard with it and have an unbalanced game uh which weird is, if it's too clearly pay to win people will stop playing you hear that lilith if it's too pay to win people will stop playing remove the healing help limit remove crystal technology ah. and content it takes a lot of resources and time to do that uh selling content is very expensive hardly any team can keep up producing content in in the uh at the pace needed and that's why rise of kingdoms doesn't do it because it's too expensive to continue to make content but games that do this well are games like fortnite where they continue to push out massive massive events on a global scale it's truly incredible they have one of the best teams also you see uh mmos like world of warcraft and stuff that keep coming out with expansions and things like that uh but rise of kingdoms doesn't really do anything like that because they are lazy no it's because it's hard this one i like a bit, bit better um uh hook habit hobby it's a model for how people progress in a game the hook is what gets you into the game to try out a free-to-play game then you build it into a habit that you play multiple sessions every day and then at the end it's the hobby phase where where people uh see it as their one of their main hobbies and they put, put lots of time and resources into it this really should be called how to get players addicted to your game like that's, that's literally what it is the hook are the insane advertisements that we've covered here on this channel the habit is you know having to send out gatherers having to spend down action potions and getting push notifications for all sorts of stuff and then hobby is when you play every day take part in events and if you're really insane maybe you make youtube videos for rise of kingdoms because you really enjoy the game oh god now if we look at this from a monetization perspective the hook is where you put up an icebreaker you want to give a really really good deal something that's a, a no-brainer you would be crazy to turn it down as a player the reason to give a really good deal up front is by making people spend up front they are also emotionally committing to your game their retention will go up this is the one dollar minamoto bundle and that's why they push it so heavily it's only a dollar you get a legendary commander and then you're committed to the game the first spend is uh it breaks the ice then they think of themselves as spenders in the game it's okay for me to spend in the game uh, lots of people are otherwise have this wall up i will never pay for a mobile game so you need to break the, the wall first the habit is like the main meat of the game this is where you sell the faster progress as we just discussed and the hobby is for the guys who have already maxed out they're the guys who have all of their clash of clans building at the max level they they are already there so you can no longer sell progress to them you have to sell consumables this is where you, you're selling uh the faster healing times or, or faster build times of armies uh, this is also where you get ba basically unlimited upper spend there it is ladies and gentlemen unlimited upper spend and that's why you have players and no offense we have players like baba who can spend whatever they want they spend millions of dollars in the game they have massive massive cities unlimited troops whatever the case might be and the game is designed to get players to that state and how successful they are at doing that will establish how successful the game ultimately becomes and as you guys know rise of kingdoms is quite successful so for rise of kingdoms this hobby here is not just like war machine this is new kvk formats this is new legendary commanders that you can spin the wheel for this is new mightiest governors this is new zenith of power skins things that really you you go for when you are at endgame and people spend insane amounts of money on those things there's no limit to how much you can spend in for instance clash of clans or rise of kingdoms so let's go down into some of, of these tr more tricks uh gotchas who hasn't heard of gotchas excellent uh, got him dude most of you have it's really the same mechanic that we have had in in western markets for for collectible playing cards like uh magic the gathering for ages you cannot no matter how much you spend you cannot directly get the card you want 
you have to over and over again pay to get uh, a bunch of random cards and hope that the thing that you wanted is in there. Welcome to the tavern, everybody. This is literally what he's talking about. Gold keys, equipment keys. This is why when they put new commanders like Ragnar in the game, they don't just give it to you. They put it in a chest because then you have to spend money to get gold keys so you can continue to do it. But even further than that, we have things like the Wheel of Fortune, where you literally could spin the Wheel of Fortune a hundred times and never get the commander. Now, of course, the odds of that are extremely low and they do have you know the spin reward milestones but that's why right that's why you can't just when a new commander comes into the game you can't just spend a hundred dollars and you get that commander no you have to spin randomly because the upper limit of how much money they can make from that is like unlimited these are great for for again both monetization and retention because people like uh the um uh, the lottery part of it i mean it's hits of dopamine right you pull the lever you spin the reel and eventually you get that legendary commander that eight spot on the wheel of fortune that we all love it's gambling except you can have it on your phone and kids can play it so you tell me how morally correct you think rise of kingdoms is for implementing tactics like this it's really a lot more exciting and you give get more content because people cannot immediately progress to the stuff they want they have to keep trying a few times so it really takes like five times as long to get the collection that they need compared to just progressing and collecting soft currency and buying it straight off and this is why the wheel of fortune comes around periodically and changes commanders every time it makes it a little bit more exclusive a little bit more rare and then you're playing you know two weeks later you'll come back to see if you can get it again then think about uh, how you want to get get to uh, get to your millions do you go the king route of having a huge volume of players and a fairly modest lifetime value for each spender or do you go uh, the machine zone route of having a very hardcore game that uh, like 95% of the population is going to look like what is that but the 5% that actually do play it they will spend a lot so rise of kingdoms is obviously a bit more towards the mobile strike model here most players don't spend money but the few that do spend millions of dollars hot state what's 12 times 47 I'm 420. Sure all of you can answer that, but you have to start your actual thinking brain to do that. Uh, now, if I say complete the sentence, bread and penis, everyone thought butter. Oh, okay. So that's the fast thinking. Our brain works in these two modes, and starting the analytical part of your brain is too much to ask for a spend. For instance, in this uh, temple run, once your game is over, save me i have a few seconds to spend hard currency and and i get to continue and this is why people at the beginning of the game are more likely to purchase minamoto and also you know when players get zero they're more likely to purchase a fate changer because these are things that players don't have to think about they just understand this is something that's going to be useful right now whereas the growth fund the 30-day gem supply everybody knows that those are the best bang for your buck but right out of the gate that's not necessarily immediately apparent to every single player and you can actually look at the bundles that most people have spent money on in rise of kingdoms and it's the you know the top five purchases are all five dollars or less all of them instant gratification loss aversion this is uh people are much more attached to the stuff they have than an equal amount of things that they can gain if i give you an, an offer um i'll flip a coin if it's tails i'll take 100 euros from you if it's uh, heads i'll give you 120 euros who would take the uh, take the bet no one. We need like 200 against 100 loss. 200 gain against 100 loss, then we'll take the deal. In games, you can apply this by giving people stuff that feels is in their pocket and then threaten to take it away unless uh, they pay up. So Rise of Kingdoms doesn't exactly do this, but you know, again, Fate Changer is a good example. Also, the fact that they make it that resources can be taken from you and troops can be taken from you, meaning they could just go away by getting zeroed, does give you an incentive to maybe buy eight hour P shields, 24 hour P shields, and those cost gems, which cost money. Office and scarcity uh, plays into the loss aversion. If there are um, rare cards up here, and you see see the goblin going with his clocks tick tock i'll take it away from you i'll take it away from you this is a brilliant way to to 
uh, get more. So this is what I was saying before about the Wheel of Fortune. It's only around for a limited time. You're more likely to spin the wheel just because it's there right now. That's also why there are timers on these bundles here. These ones, not so much, but the ones that pop up for a limited time, for example, the writer of history bundle, you get a legendary commander and boom, you have a certain amount of time to buy this extremely valuable bundle. Otherwise it goes away and it's only $5. Why not? And bam, you are hooked. <laughs> Me too. Subscription. Does anyone recognize the guy? He's the builder me. from um, Clash of Clans. The point of this is the builder ha has a very specific way of working. If you spend your hard currency on this guy, you will only get the benefit from him if you then keep coming back to the game very often. And this is why the 30 day gem supply gives you so many gems for $10 because they know that it's actually more valuable for them to get you to at least log in every day. Sure. They maybe would rather you spend a hundred dollars for that many gems, but just the fact that they're getting you to come back every day, that's why they're willing to give you so many gems for such a low price. It's worth it for them to keep you playing. So it drives both retention and uh, monetization. The Ikea effect. Uh, stuff that we put work into, we value more highly. Uh, you know, IKEA really sells you cardboard stuff. It's shit. But you value <laughs> it still somehow slightly higher because you actually built it yourselves. This is how we build, build habits. Uh, there's a trigger to remind us to do something, then we go do an action, we get the variable reward, just like the gachas, we, we get uh, the lottery ticket, and then to really hook it down, we need to ask people to do something for us, do a little bit of work, because then they become emotionally attached to that. So Rides of Kingdoms does this in a number of ways, right? You have the gatherers that you send out every day. Now, let me ask you this, why do you have to gather, right? You already have, you know, nodes in your city that generate resources over time. Why would they also make you have to send out to gather more resources why not just make it so these these buildings produce more resources and why is there a cap on these well the reason is because they want you to come back and put in that little bit of effort right this is also the purpose of the daily the daily quests right you come back every single day and you put in the work to actually do these quests and they give you rewards at the end of it also looser and scrolls gives you a reason to come back and actually do some of these challenges so that way you can gain some more rewards and then they do this every season we'll talk more about looser and scrolls in a little bit though this also is why you get push notifications to your phone telling you hey you can no longer hold more resources come in and collect them from your city or your gatherers have returned i personally have completely turned off push notifications for rise of kingdoms i did this when i first downloaded downloaded Rise of Kingdoms because I hate push notifications for games like this. But for many of you guys, I'm sure that you open your phone and play Rise of Kingdoms because specifically of a notification that you've gotten. Anchoring is fun. Anchoring means that when we don't know the price of stuff, the first price we hear suggested for it becomes our anchor. And then we compare everything to that. So how to use this in a game? Some games immediately uh, when you're in, in the tutorial, they suggest to you, you should buy this good IAP for 50 euros or, or something like that. I, I go like, oh, that's expensive. I'll never do that. Of course, no. And I expect them to say no. Then again, I come back, back like uh, a few se sessions later and suggest they buy it for, for 15. And I will say, that's a good value because my anchor was at 50. So Rise of Kings does this in a few different ways. It doesn't necessarily give you a discount on the existing bundles, but it does tell you exactly what the game claims the bundle might be worth and then gives you a price that you can pay instead. It also anchors the price of the legendary commander sculpture at 2000 gems per sculpture in the VIP shop. So in any event or any instance where you can get a legendary commander sculpture for less than 2000, you think it's a deal. And therefore, especially with like holiday bundles for example you'll spend the money on that because you think oh wow i'm getting a legendary commander sculpture for 500 or a thousand gems each to you is a deal that's 50 percent off but really no one's really buying these for 2000 unless you're a mega whale it's deceiving i'm telling you man it is deception and it feels dirty social proof uh, so this is, we are herd animals, we tend to do what all, all of the others do. Uh, you all sit quiet listening to me because that's what all, all of the other guys do, do here. Which reminds me, most of you guys who are watching are subscribed to the channel. So if you're not subscribed, you're kind of a weirdo, dude. You really should probably go down there and subscribe. This means that uh, you should have uh, the socially accepted way of behaving in your game should be paying. 
you want to tell people, for instance, their, when a clan member of theirs spend IAP money, you want the whole clan to know, because then that becomes the socially acceptable way of behaving. Yes, yeah, so if you guys ever wondered why you got a chest when somebody else spends money, it's because it's literally advertising to you, hey, look, your friends are spending money. Look at all these people that you know that are spending money. Hey, look at everyone else but you is spending money. Isn't that crazy? And then you feel more enticed to do it and you feel more comfortable doing it because hey, everyone else is doing it. You absolutely do not want to tell them that the majority of people in your game never spend money. That's poison. Never tell them that. It's true though. Availability means that the stuff we hear a lot about is the stuff we judge as uh, likely to happen. This, for instance, can tie into gotchas. Uh, if there are rare gotchas, not every player will see them every session. That's like the definition of rare. Duh. Which means that they will think that it's not likely to happen, that they get one of those, which means that you should tell them about it, which means every time a clan member gets one of the rare things, you should broadcast it to, to all of the others, like your friend got this l rare or legendary thing. So I'll give them that. Rise of Kingdoms doesn't tell the entire server when you summon a legendary commander in the tavern, but they do make sure that you see legendary commanders often, whether it's in events like this or the Wheel of Fortune, or how many of you are familiar with seeing Cao Cao's face here in the daily special offer. There's a reason that they give you something free to claim on this specific screen every single day you will log in and you will claim this free chest even though you don't even probably know what's in this chest you know what's in this chest uh, it's like a thousand food a thousand wood and a thousand stone i'm pretty sure that's all that you get from this chest but you click and claim it every single day because it's free why not right and there's also that little red bubble that is you know if you don't click it it drives you crazy but the reason they do that is because then you look at a legendary commander every single day and you think wow that could be mine even though if you actually buy these bundles the chances of getting a ton of these sculptures are low look at this one percent chance of getting 10 south south sculptures like it's insane how low the chances are of actually getting what you're looking at right here which is a full south south summon there's a bunch of data on uh this that whales take longer time time to convert this is just another reminder for you to have content for a bloody long time that's me actually that's me i spent a ton of months playing rise of kingdoms uh, with pretty, as pretty much free to play right and now i've spent a few thousand dollars on the game so that's true but that's also why if you look in your academy they fill the game with random stuff that just takes time for absolutely no reason why do i have to do 10 levels of gem gathering speed when i will almost never gather gems why does it take so long to level up the watchtower because you need to get arrows of resistance which is just an arbitrary item that they they randomly put into the game to make it longer for you to get to t5 and this is what they do that's also why books of the covenant takes so long to get for what your castle who cares about the castle this has like almost nothing to do with anything now of course if you're a rally lead sure this is relevant but other than that what's that have to do with unlocking a tier 5 unit it's got nothing to do with it the, the only reason that it takes so long to get to t5 is because that increases the probability that you will start to spend money because the longer you are invested in the game the longer you're playing the game Game, the more likely you will fall into that trap of thinking that you have to pay to get there and once you get in then you're hooked i also talked about this on my truth of the watchtower video go ahead and check that out remember there are four ways of progressing in in games in general you can have a skill game based game you can have a luck based game you can have a game where you just progress by grinding or you can pay to uh to progress make sure that your games aren't too skill based i made that mistake myself that is the biggest red flag uh, for anybody who enjoys video games in general make sure your game isn't too skill based like there couldn't be a worse thing for a game developer to do than to make the game mostly about luck grind and paying and this is the reality of games like rise of kingdoms if you have 500 million power because you spent a ton of money then you can take down pretty much any player that you want even if you don't have the optimal commander pairings you were able to at least buy really good commanders really good equipment for those commanders and the skill element is only a small faction right of course if you're playing up against another ultra powerful player then of course then you have to have some skill involved but yeah that's why they call games like this pay to win because it's more important to pay than it is to be good at it a two skill based game you don't get people to pay for pay you because there's no reason to 
So make sure grinding and paying are legitimate versions of progressing in the game. Now that's it for his presentation, but I also wanted to talk about the Lucerne Scrolls. This is literally just a battle pass feature. Pretty much all of the top grossing mobile games these days has some sort of battle pass system. Lucerne Scrolls is it. And the reason that this is such a good monetization strategy is because it's sort of like seasons, right? You keep coming back for whatever the new Lucerne Scrolls reward is. And it's always something that's pretty valuable. You can get, you know, legendary uh, equipment that you can put here and you know before that it was city skins anyway i would love to know your thoughts about lilith and their monetization strategies down below this video was way longer than i thought it would be so hopefully you guys if you made it all the way to the end you'll drop a thumbs up on it it really helps out the video a ton it gets it out into that youtube algorithm of course if you're not subscribed yet go ahead and subscribe to the channel and click that bell to be notified the next time that i upload a video my social media links they're all in the description below make sure you follow me over there on instagram twitter facebook and discord and with that being said guys thank you so much for watching this is been Omniarch. I will talk to you guys again soon. Peace.